In this class, we're going to talk about how to critically appraise literature and interpret data, how causality is determined in epidemiology, and we'll continue discussing how to evaluate data quality. We'll also talk about the current media landscape and how this impacts both the information you gather for your own work and also serves as the context for public health communications when you're disseminating information to the public. The basic objective in epidemiology is to prevent disease by finding the cause of disease, removing the cause, then evaluating whether the disease has been prevented after we removed the cause. So epidemiologists need to identify what factors cause the disease or other health outcome so they know what to target with their interventions. The cause of disease is an event, condition, or characteristic that preceded the disease and without which the disease either would not have occurred at all or would not have occurred until some time later. So how do we determine cause in epidemiology? Often clinical observations lead to the generation of a hypothesis about a possible causal association. Then a literature review is conducted to determine if this question has already been answered. If not, sometimes the next step would be to do an in vitro study, from the Latin in glass, where we can test a causal hypothesis in a petri dish or a test tube to see if the theory seems to hold true. When a hypothesis is amenable to testing with an in vitro study, that's a great way to directly test an idea without all the costs and ethical considerations and time needed for human studies. In vitro studies can also be helpful for generating new hypotheses and indicating possible mechanisms of harm or protection. But in vitro studies need to be validated by in vivo studies by proving they can predict the specific effect in animals before moving on to human studies. If in vitro studies show the hypothesized relationship exists, the next step is sometimes to go to an animal model to see if the findings in the petri dish will hold up in a rat or a mouse, for example. In vivo is from the Latin in life. Assessing whether the relationship holds true within a living organism is an important step before moving to human studies. Randomized controlled trials are the gold standard for determining causal relationships along with prospective cohort studies, but sometimes it isn't ethical to randomize humans to treatment groups, so in some cases we go directly to observational studies in human populations. If a randomized controlled trial also finds the same relationship found in the animal model, the next step would be to then conduct an observational study to see if that holds true in the real world outside of a controlled setting. It's usually necessary to use a stepwise incremental approach because just because something works well in a petri dish doesn't mean it will work well in a mouse, and just because something works in a mouse doesn't mean it will work in a human. And sometimes randomized controlled trial findings don't even translate well into the real world. In class one of this course, I briefly introduced the socio-ecological model as an example of a framework for understanding the cause of disease as being multifactorial. The causes of most diseases in humans are very complex, which is why sometimes even randomized controlled trial findings don't translate well into the real world because people have all these other factors at play that influence human health and the development of disease or protection from disease. To identify a causal factor, first we need to determine that an association between exposure or risk factor and the disease or outcome of interest exists. This can be done with ecological studies on group characteristics, which is a quick, inexpensive way to gather information about the risk of disease in the real world. But while ecological studies are helpful for generating hypotheses and documenting the co-occurrence of disease and other factors in a population, they look at data at the population level rather than individual level, so they can't tell if risk factors and disease are occurring in the same people within the population and they're vulnerable to the ecological fallacy, which is when inferences are made about individuals from groups. Without data on the individual level, you often can't see the true relation between a risk factor and disease. An association can also be established with studies of individuals we discussed in the previous class, including cohort studies, case control studies, and cross-sectional studies. If an association between the risk factor and the disease is found, then we investigate whether the association may be causal. If it's not causal, it could be due to chance, confounding, or bias, 
If it is causal, we could move forward and design an intervention, which we can then implement and evaluate to test if it worked to prevent the disease. Robert Koch was a German physician and microbiologist who lived from 1843 to 1910. That portrait of him was taken in 1905 when he won the Nobel Prize. Bacteria had been discovered previously, but he was the first to design an experiment to show that bacteria were the cause of disease. He discovered the causes of cholera, anthrax, tuberculosis, and he also worked with malaria. He's most well known for his guidelines for establishing a microorganism as the causative agent of an infectious disease. His first postulate was that the microorganism should be found in disease but not healthy individuals. The microorganism can then be isolated from the diseased individual and grown in pure culture in the laboratory. He also helped pioneer using auger and petri dishes to grow bacteria. He initially tried using potato slices, which didn't work so well, but he was able to successfully grow the bacteria he worked with in petri dishes with auger. The cultured microorganism will then cause disease when transferred to a healthy, susceptible individual. And when that newly infected individual becomes ill, the same microorganism can be re-isolated from that individual and grown again. The principles behind Cox postulates are still considered relevant today, although subsequent developments such as the discovery of microorganisms that cannot grow in cell-free culture, such as obligate intracellular bacterial pathogens and non-living pathogens such as viruses and prions, have caused the guidelines themselves to be reinterpreted for the molecular era. Even back then, he intended for these to be guidelines to determine that microbes cause a specific disease, not hard, fast rules. He worked extensively with anthrax, which works well with his postulates. Using anthrax in hippos as an example, we would be able to find Bacillus anthraxis in diseased hippos, but not in healthy hippos. You can collect a sample of the bacteria from a diseased hippo and grow it in the lab. If you inoculate a healthy animal with Bacillus anthraxis, it will develop anthrax, and you can then re-isolate Bacillus anthraxis from the sick hippo and grow it again in the lab. So anthrax satisfies all four of Cox postulates. Like Cox postulates, the Bradford Hill criteria for causality should also be viewed as guidelines and not a checklist. Causality is not determined by any one factor, Rather, it's a conclusion built on the preponderance of the evidence. Temporality is the most important criteria for determining cause. The exposure must come before the outcome. You should also consider the strength of the association. For example, a relative risk of 6 is much more convincing than a relative risk of 1.1. If there's a dose-response effect, meaning that as the exposure level changes, the effect changes, this provides supportive evidence of a causal relationship. Findings across research studies and populations should be consistent. So if one study found a strong association, but others didn't, that would not support a causal association. It should be plausible. The biological mechanism should make sense. Alternative explanations or hypotheses should have been considered. Removal of the exposure should lower the risk if the exposure causes harm, and removal should increase the risk if it's protective. Specificity means one exposure should cause one disease, and the disease is caused by the one exposure, but this is the least important of Hill's criteria because it often doesn't hold true for human disease. And finally, coherence. The findings should be compatible with existing knowledge and theories on the topic involved. As a quick thought exercise, think of a disease and a factor related to that disease and go through each of these criteria on your own to see if your example would meet Hill's criteria. The cause of disease can be either direct or indirect. In a direct relationship, the factor causes the disease directly. And for an indirect cause, there's a pathway with one or more steps that lead to the development of disease. Factors can be necessary and sufficient. Anthrax is a suitable example for this one. The causative bacteria, Bacillus anthraxis, is naturally found in soil, plants, and water in some places where it's endemic, 
Bacillus anthraxis is a gram-positive rod that can form endospores, which allow it to be inactive for many years. And then when environmental conditions become favorable again, it can then infect an animal when the animal ingests soil, plants, or water. Bacillus anthraxis was the first bacteria to be experimentally shown to be pathogenic by Robert Koch. If a factor is necessary but not sufficient, it can't cause the disease on its own. You need the second factor to be present as well. When prescribing an antiretroviral regimen for someone living with HIV that contains a bacavir, we always have to screen for HLA-B5701, which is an allele of the major histocompatibility complex 1. And if people have that allele, it means they're at risk of developing a hypersensitivity reaction if they take a bacavir. A bacavir is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, and it's a component of Triumac, which you may have heard of. Triumac is a bacavir, dolutegravir, and lamivudine combined into one tablet. If someone takes a bacavir who has the HLA-B5701 allele, they can have a severe allergic reaction, which can be life-threatening. Such a reaction usually occurs within the first six weeks of taking antiretroviral therapy containing a bacavir and may cause a skin rash, fever, malaise, gastrointestinal symptoms, respiratory symptoms, and can lead to Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which is a really serious skin reaction, or systemic lupus erythematous, or lupus. 5 to 8% of the population has the HLB5701 allele, so we have to screen everyone for it before prescribing a regimen containing a bacavir because we can't know based on someone's race or ethnicity or heritage if they have the allele or not. But there's a simple blood test we use for screening. In this example, if a person has the HLA-B5701 allele and they aren't HIV positive, they probably would never know it and there would never be an issue. But if they have the allele and they're prescribed abacavir, then they may have an abacavir-induced hypersensitivity reaction. So both factors have to be present to cause an abacavir-induced hypersensitivity reaction. If a factor is sufficient but not necessary, you can have either of two factors, but you don't need both factors to be present. Shingles is caused by varicella zoster virus, which is the same virus that causes chickenpox. When a person has chickenpox, they never get rid of the virus. It stays in the body indefinitely in a dormant state. Then many years later, often in the elderly, a person may be under stress from a different illness or even psychological stress, such as moving to a new city, and that stress can allow the dormant varicella zoster virus to become reactivated and cause shingles. So all of us that had chickenpox when we were young, because the vaccine didn't exist yet, are at risk of getting shingles. Chickenpox is highly contagious. So if you come in contact with someone with chickenpox and you aren't immune from vaccination, you'll get chickenpox if you've never had the virus before. And if you've already had it, you can get shingles. It's less common for people to get the virus from someone with shingles, but it definitely does still happen. That's actually how I got chickenpox when I was a baby. My grandfather had shingles, so then I got chickenpox. In this example, there's more than one potential mechanism for causing the same disease. If a factor is neither necessary nor sufficient, you can have factor A and factor B and get the disease, or you can have factor C and factor D and get the disease. One example I thought of was with severe allergic reactions. If someone has a severe penicillin allergy and they get exposed to penicillin, they will have an anaphylactic reaction. Or if someone has a severe peanut allergy and they get exposed to peanuts, they will have a severe allergic reaction. So anaphylaxis has multiple causes each of which requires two factors. This sufficient component cause model is still a theoretical framework used today occasionally by epidemiologists, but it does have some major pitfalls. The necessary and sufficient model became popular as microbial causes of infectious diseases were first discovered, so people were thinking that maybe all diseases had some microscopic cause we just hadn't been able to see before. But as the cause of human disease has shifted from infectious to non-communicable chronic diseases, this model has become less useful. 
Most diseases have many causal factors, and even for some of the most common diseases, there's still causal factors that remain unknown. In real life, most identified disease component causes are neither necessary nor sufficient to cause a disease by themselves. In Lecture 3, we discussed data sources, and Part 2 of Lecture 3 was about public health surveillance, which is an important source of data used by epidemiologists. I wanted to briefly touch on how to conduct a literature review. This isn't a main topic in this course, but knowing how to find and critically appraise evidence is a critical step in the process we've been talking about in this class. I know some of you are very familiar with this process and probably don't need a review at all, while this process might be newer for others. So I'm going to post some resources on Blackboard below this lecture so you can self-identify if that would be helpful for you or not based on your past knowledge and experience. If you aren't familiar with how to search for articles on PubMed, Medline, Cochrane, and other databases, definitely check out those other resources I'm going to post. Especially when you're learning, it can be helpful to use critical appraisal tools and checklists tailored to various study designs. You should all be familiar with the basic sections of a research paper. The abstract provides a brief overview, which is really helpful for determining if the paper is what you're looking for or not. The introduction provides background and context for the study. The methods section tells you how the study was actually conducted, which is important to review in detail to look at if the methods were technically sound and identify potential ways bias may have been introduced or if there may be confounding variables and whether or not confounders were adequately controlled for. The results section summarizes their data. And in the discussion section, the authors should present both statistically significant and findings that were not statistically significant, if any. And they should openly discuss limitations of their study and suggest possible implications of their findings. This is not a complete list, but when you're assessing study design, a few things to look for are whether there was randomization, what they did to control for confounding variables, if there was bias, and whether the controls were similar to the cases or the treatment group. When reading a discussion section, ask yourself whether you agree with the author's conclusions based on their data. Were their findings statistically significant? Did they report measures of association appropriate for the study design they used? If not, that's obviously a red flag. Was the study adequately powered, or did they need a bigger sample size than they were able to obtain? If the study appears to have internal validity, does it have external validity? Is it generalizable to the population you're working with? Are there any reasons the findings from the study population may not be applicable to your community? As an optional, non-graded learning activity, read the article by Igorova and answer the following questions on your own. We've been talking about how you, as a public health professional, should find quality information and evaluate it before using the information in your work. In the first class, I briefly reviewed the public health process, and similar to an outbreak investigation, communicating your findings is a final step in addition to evaluation. People often think about manuscripts and scientific journals, but in many cases, there's an ethical obligation for the epidemiologist to share findings with the community and individuals who participated in the research. For example, if you conduct a study using human subjects who voluntarily provide their blood or complete a survey about their health, you need to show your appreciation by telling those helpful people what you found once you've analyzed your data. Academic manuscripts are usually not an effective method for communicating your findings to research study participants or the general public. There's many forms communication with the public can take, and what media you use should be tailored to your specific audience and the message you're trying to get across. A research study may produce a one-page flyer with a summary of key findings as bullet points in plain language but an oral presentation at a community meeting may be better for some communities. Epidemiologists also need to communicate with the public about strategies to mitigate the risk of injury or chronic diseases. They also communicate with the public during emergencies, such as hurricanes, as well as infectious disease outbreaks. Communicating with the public isn't traditionally emphasized or even talked about in epidemiology courses, 
but in today's media landscape, I think it needs to be. I'm not a communications expert, and when I was an MPH student years ago, my epidemiology class didn't discuss communication or media at all. But the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the importance of having epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists who are able to effectively communicate with the public in today's rapidly evolving media landscape. This skill will be increasingly important going forward, so I expect each of you will need to adapt to communicating with the public using new technologies and new media formats in your own careers. Academic writing is still an important skill, but using social media and other new technologies effectively is likely more important when communicating with the public. Normal people don't read academic journal articles every day. Good clinicians do, but we may not accurately be labeled as normal. If the target audience for your message is practicing clinicians, then academic writing may be the most effective medium. But otherwise, you're going to need to be more creative with how you target your message and tailor it to the people who need to hear it. In general, effective public health communication should be clear, concise, and consistent. To communicate clearly when communicating risk to the public, remember that risk is usually easier for people to understand than odds. It's also a good practice to never use acronyms. If you're going to use acronyms, always write it out first and then put the acronym in parentheses. The APA guidelines for citation have a list of acronyms that you're allowed to use in APA papers. And I think that serves as a good guideline even for non-academic writing, because if it's on their list, you're probably safe to use the acronym, but otherwise definitely write it out. For example, according to APA, you can say HIV rather than human immunodeficiency virus and CDC rather than the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, because those are both very common acronyms. Avoiding acronyms is especially important if you're working with a community where English is not everyone's first language. For example, if you're working with rural elders in Alaska whose primary language is their tribal language, it would be especially important to avoid acronyms and technical jargon. It's important both in academic writing and in public health communications to the public to be as concise as you can while still conveying your point. If you're editing your own work, challenge yourself to make things as concise as possible and keep editing it down until you get to a point where it's not going to make sense anymore if you take out more words. It's important for public health messaging to be consistent. And if you expect that the science may evolve over time, be transparent with the public about that up front. That way, if your message changes, it won't come off as if you've made an error or are being dishonest. Related to consistency in communication, repetition across sources and media is also important. A well-crafted message is also tailored to the target audience, invokes emotion, and should be delivered by a trusted source. Who a trusted source is, is different for every community. If you aren't the best person to be delivering the message, that's okay. None of us can be the trusted messenger for every message in every community. If you're working with a community and a culture that is not your own, one technique for getting your message out there is to use a training of trainers approach. For example, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I was living in and working in a community with an HIV prevalence of 43%. And this was back before antiretroviral medications were available in rural areas. They sent me there because people were dying of AIDS left and right, and while medications weren't available, there was a lot that could be done to improve quality of life and increase longevity. This would be an example of tertiary prevention. So I mostly worked on nutrition interventions for rural farmers. The rural farmers in this area had a common practice of bringing all of their crops that they grew to market, especially when there was a big market day once a month but they couldn't sell everything they brought into town. People would only buy the most attractive produce, and the rest of it would just go to waste. It would just rot. At the same time, back out on the farm, the farmers and their families were only living on matoke, which is unripe bananas cooked for many, many hours until it makes a mashed potato consistency golden brown starch. Living on matoke alone doesn't provide the nutrition or calories that people needed. 
people living with untreated HIV need about three times as many calories as most adults. So by only eating one plate of matoke a day, people were dying much more quickly than they should have otherwise because they were so malnourished. There was also a Buganda tribal belief that when someone is sick, you should not allow them to eat because they believed that eating while sick would make you worse. So family members trying to help would often withhold food when people were getting AIDS and becoming visibly ill and very weak, which also expedited mortality from AIDS. So the message I was trying to convey was to teach the farmers to keep the ugly fruits and vegetables and cook with them and eat them at home. Don't take all the produce to market because you won't be able to sell it all and it'll just go to waste. But as a white woman, I was definitely not remotely the trusted messenger and that was never going to change. For household issues that relate to economics, the man in the Buganda culture is the decision maker. So I worked with an organization of agricultural professionals. These were mostly men who had gotten a doctoral degree in agriculture and permaculture techniques. They already had a program in these rural communities where they were teaching permaculture techniques and ways of farming that are less vulnerable to the extreme climate change Uganda was starting to experience. They usually have two dry seasons and two rainy seasons that alternate. But the timing of those seasons was starting to get unpredictable, and the droughts were getting longer, the rains would be too heavy, they were having flooding, and at other times it was so dry there was nothing to water the crops with. Because these men were already working with the farmers, teaching them better agricultural practices, I worked in the office of the agricultural professionals, so I got to know them, I spent time with them every day, and I taught them a class once a week for many months about HIV and how to mitigate the impacts of HIV. Initially, my objective was to combat stigma, for example, by explaining that if you shake hands with a man who has HIV, you cannot get the virus. There were a lot of myths that I was trying to debunk. And after many months of that, I moved on to then start teaching them what I wanted them to teach the rural farmers. It took many months and many classroom sessions where I was using a paper flip chart and teaching from memory because not only did I not have internet, I didn't have books or electricity a lot of the time, but the project was successful. The agricultural professionals were able to get the rural men to change their practices and start keeping food at home and cooking it. So they were adding tomatoes to their matoke and carrots and even bell peppers. This was a fairly small change, but given the circumstances, improving nutrition for this population likely had an important impact on quality of life and longevity. That was a long example, but the point I'm trying to make is if you aren't the trusted source, that's okay. There's many different ways that you might be able to go through an intermediary that's a member of the local community they're trying to reach to get the message to the population that needs the information. Along the same lines as my Peace Corps example, it's really important to work with the community from the outset. Especially if you're an outsider, you need to spend time getting to know the community and listening to what the community wants. If you ever find yourself sitting in a conference room and a group of epidemiologists are talking about what they're going to do in a community or what they're going to research, it might be helpful to remind them that they should be asking the community what their priorities are and then developing health interventions with the community in partnership. This lack of community-based approaches can lead to further mistrust of public health and the medical community. We don't ever want people to feel like they're being experimented on. If research is being done in the community, it should be the community helping to lead that research. It should be their research because it's their data and it's their health we're trying to improve. An example you're all familiar with, which I think presents a good learning opportunity, is the evolution of messaging on masking during the COVID-19 pandemic. In March of 2020, you may recall originally the CDC initially said don't wear a mask if you haven't been trained how to wear one properly because you'll just touch your face repeatedly and make it worse. 
They didn't say that out of the blue. That actually was based on a lot of literature that documented that when people without training on how to wear a mask properly are told to wear one, they'll often touch the front of the mask, which is considered contaminated, repeatedly with their hands, and they'll let it slide down below their nose so it's not blocking their own respiratory droplets anyway. And when they take it off, they may touch the front, which again is contaminated, and then they may not wash their hands properly afterwards and may touch their nose and their eyes. So there was evidence that giving people who don't know how to wear a mask properly a mask might actually cause more people to get infected because then they're touching their face a whole bunch during a pandemic. And the other early message was that the public should not wear masks because we needed to conserve the masks for healthcare workers due to severe supply shortages. I helped set up a COVID-19 testing program in downtown San Francisco early in the pandemic, and I had to wear my same N95 mask for at least four eight-hour shifts of doing COVID-19 testing because we couldn't buy more, even in San Francisco. Not long after that, the CDC changed the message to wear a mask or any face covering when in public. It could be a bandana, it could be a balaclava, any mask is better than no mask. Then, very briefly, following vaccine rollout, the CDC said if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask, even in large gatherings. But very soon after that, they realized vaccines didn't prevent infection as well as some people had hoped, and more transmissible variants were emerging. So then, they changed the message and said everyone still needs to wear a mask, even if you're vaccinated. Then months later, they changed the message to, you should wear a mask for 10 days after becoming infected with COVID-19, but masks are otherwise optional. Some consequences of this were confusion, misinformation, disinformation, distrust in the public health and medical community, and non-adherence to public health recommendations. What can we learn from COVID-19 communication challenges and do better next time? One point I didn't mention on the previous slide is it's important to make an effort to remain apolitical when representing public health or your employer. Decoupling the scientific process from the political process can avoid immediately isolating a lot of the population that may shut down and stop listening if your message is perceived as political. Another lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic is the extremely important role that social media and other new media formats play in communicating information or doing the opposite. Social media isn't going away, neither is misinformation or disinformation, so we in epidemiology and related fields need to pivot and learn how to keep doing our job of making the public healthier given that reality. Circling back to the importance of developing your skill in appraising data quality, this graph shows the credibility of the 100 most shared health articles on social media in 2018. I was worried this might be outdated, but I looked it up again, and it's still pretty much the same, if not worse. The truth is often not as sexy as fake news. So we need to figure out better ways of combating false information about public health and other topics. In 2019, the World Health Organization named vaccine hesitancy as one of the 10 leading threats to global health. And a lot of vaccine hesitancy has been tied to Facebook groups and other misinformation on social media. The Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan organization that conducted an online survey which led to its report titled Teens, Social Media, and Technology 2022. Their survey was administered in English and Spanish and had 1,316 respondents. One thing that really stands out to me looking at this data is how different social media use is between different generations currently. When I first saw this, I looked at the YouTube category and I was like, what the heck are people doing on YouTube? Like, I don't, <laughs> clearly I'm missing something. I used YouTube recently when my garage door opener broke and I had to take apart the whole thing and figure out where the wire was that was out of place. And I similarly use it for instructional videos like that. But I honestly don't know what younger people are using it for. But it's clearly not that, given that 19% of teens are using it almost constantly and 41% are using it several times a day, 17% once a day. Combined, that means 77% of American teens in 2022 were using YouTube at least daily. That's shocking to me.
This shows how important it is to understand the community whose health you're trying to improve. Because if you don't really understand the community, whatever message you're trying to get across is going to flop. For example, if you were trying to reach teens with a harm reduction campaign, let's say, and you bought ads on Facebook, you can be reasonably confident that most of your target audience would never see your public health campaign. The United States Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, issued an advisory in May about the risks of social media to the brains and mental health of children and adolescents. Proving a causal relationship between social media use and teen mental health declining is a good example of the challenge to prove causation with epidemiologic data. Because we have reason to suspect that social media causes harm, it wouldn't be ethical to randomize some teens to use TikTok constantly, for example, and some teens to not have access to social media. We can't do a randomized controlled trial to study this topic. With social media use and teen mental health, it's also hard to know if a causal relationship does exist, which direction is it in? Do depressed teenagers use social media more? Or do teenagers who use social media more become depressed? Are the effects of interacting with content generated by people who you know in real life different from seeing content generated by strangers or bots? These questions are all difficult to study using epidemiologic methods. The Alaska Health Misinformation Response Project is a new organization working to address some of these issues. They have more resources on their website, but here's a quick video they produced. Let's talk about misinformation. Misinformation is false information that people share without intending to do harm. Those spreading misinformation typically believe the information is true. We see examples of misinformation all the time. Sometimes old pictures and images are shared as though they were new. Some people even use cute pictures or videos to build an audience for their misinformation. And if it's done on purpose to mislead people or to cause harm, then it's called disinformation. So how do we know if information is true? And how can you help stop the spread of misinformation or disinformation? First, check the source. Does the information come from a trusted and well-respected source? Second, check if the source has expertise in this area. If the source is discussing how eagles affect Alaska's salmon population, then what kind of knowledge does this person have in this field? Next, check to see if there is agreement or consensus on the information. Anyone can have an opinion, but what do the majority of experts in this subject area say? After that, notice the language used. Is it emotionally charged or cause you to feel upset or angry? Strong emotional language can often call up outrage or fear. And online computer algorithms can amplify these emotions by showing even more of the same content. Finally, check the facts using trustworthy sources. If you encounter misleading information, try using a truth sandwich. Suppose you're responding to the statement that COVID-19 is no worse than the common cold. Start with the truth. In this case, you could say COVID-19 is much more dangerous than a cold. Then, explain how the claim is misleading, emphasizing the truth behind it. Mild COVID-19 and the common cold have many similarities, but COVID-19 can lead to hospitalization and death. Colds do not. <laughs> Lastly, return to the truth. Always repeat more of the truth rather than what isn't factual. COVID is a bigger health concern than a cold. According to the state of Alaska, more than 1,000 Alaskans have died from COVID-19, and many who survive have developed long-term problems. Long COVID conditions include tiredness, sleep disturbance, anxiety, confusion, trouble breathing, strokes, heart conditions, and acute diabetes. When you're using a truth sandwich, always remember to use the triple E response, engagement with empathy and education. Think about how the other person might feel. For more effective conversations, best practices include being civil, finding common ground, using the facts, thinking about whether you should respond privately or publicly, and most of all, being patient. While it takes patience, time, and dedication to help prevent the spread of misinformation in Alaska, it is well worth the effort. A healthier information environment benefits you, me, and all our fellow Alaskans.
For more resources and information, please visit akmisinforesponse.org. A thought to leave you with. How would you use the epidemiologic triangle to describe the impacts of social media on our population's health? Imagine trying to drag and drop social media and electronic devices to the question mark at the appropriate part of the epidemiologic triangle. Is content the last variable, or should it be something else?